This is actually the sixth annual lecture from the Center for Transnational Mennonite Studies or CTMS. And, oh, we get lots of greetings coming through. That's great. Everyone, please use the chat to introduce yourselves. I should introduce myself. My name is Aileen Friesen. I am, along with Dr. Ben Nobbs Thiessen, uh, the director of the Center for Transnational Mennonite Studies at the University of Winnipeg. Our center is located on Treaty 1, the ancestral and, and traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Anishinu, the Assiniboine, Cree, Dakota, Dene, and the heartland of the Métis Nation. For those of you interested in learning more about in the history of Indigenous Mennonite encounters, our friends at Conrad Grable College are having a conference next week, so be sure to tune into that. But this evening, we are, um, like I said before, having the sixth annual lecture, uh, CTMS lecture. And so I'd just like to take a moment to introduce CTMS. CTMS is a research center that approaches the history and culture of Mennonites within a transnational, Mennonite, a transnational context. It is a partnership between the Chair in Mennonite Studies and the DF Platt Historical Research Foundation. And this evening, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Melanie Campen, our center's DF Platt Historical Research Foundation postdoctoral fellow. Uh, Dr. Campen is a graduate of the Tor Toronto School of Theology, and she, she has published um, and researched on issues of trauma and reconciliation, including her dissertation entitled The Spectre of Reconciliation, Investigations in Mennonite Theology, Martyrdom and Trauma, and a chapter, she's published a chapter entitled On the, the Need for Critical, Contextual, and Trauma-Informed Methods in Mennonite Theology and Ethics in the book Recovering from the Anabaptist Vision. And she's also published an article entitled The Mennonite Peacemaker Myth, Reconciliation Without Truth-Telling in the journal The Conrad Grable Review. Tonight, she will be sharing new research conducted during her postdoctoral fellowship on an important topic which has not received the academic attention that it deserves. Her presentation is entitled, Reporting on Sexual Violence in Mennonite Newspapers. And as Dr. Campen presents, please post any questions that you have in the Q&A section, uh, not in the chat. Uh, we'll be able to find them better in the Q&A. And so Dr. Campen, please uh, take over this, or please give us your presentation. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to see uh, so many people joining us. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Platt Foundation for funding this research project and Eileen for supervising it. I want to thank Conrad Chase and Selena Wolf at the Mennonite Heritage Archives for helping me find uh, data. I also wouldn't have been able to accomplish this work without the advice of Carol Penner, Tina Fairkaler, and Jamie Friesen, who served as my research accountability circle. Thank you also to Jeremy Weeb and Evan Malaysia at CTMS for hosting this webinar, and of course, to each one of you for coming to listen and engage in this important work virtually. So when I set out to begin my Platt postdoc research a year ago, the project proposal looked a little bit different uh, than what I ended up with. Due to ethical and safety concerns related to interviewing victim survivors of sexual violence directly, I turned my attention to the archives instead. Initially, as per, per the uh, Platt Foundation's mandate, I was going to focus on how sexual violence was reported on for Mennonites who were descendants of the 1870s migration to Canada. However, it quickly became evident in the newspapers that the movement to address sexual violence it, among this specific group of Mennonites took place within a larger historical context in which all Mennonite subgroups in Canada and the US began addressing issues of domestic violence and sexual violence in their communities. Both Der Bote and the Canadian Mennonite cover abuse cases, community education and pastoral training, for General Conference Mennonites, Mennonite Brethren, Bergtaler, Kortitsa, Evangelical Mennonite Conference, and Brethren in Christ. The specific Mennonite group is identified in any given article, 
But beyond that, the reports on sexual abuse do not discuss any differences between these groups. This is very interesting given the historical and theological differences between these groups. Instead, throughout the newspapers, all these different groups of Mennonites are being challenged by disclosures of abuse and are looking for pastoral training, community education, and support for victim survivors. A common thread throughout the newspapers is the central role of Mennonite Central Committee in organizing education, training, and support across all these different Mennonite groups and even binationally. In my research, I wanted to focus on Canadian Mennonite experiences specifically, but a lot of the work done by MCC was binational, and there were conferences co-sponsored by Canadian and American MCC subcommittees held in both countries with participants from both countries. Therefore, I have included these in my research. The abstract for this lecture states that I will cover the time period from the 1870s to the present, but due to time constraints, I've decided to focus on the 1980s and 1990s because this was the time period in which Mennonite communities across Canada and the US experienced a kind of reckoning with regards to sexual violence in their own churches and substantial challenges to the rethinking their peace theology. There are a few limitations I want to note before I begin. The first is the limitation of research done with an index. An index is a kind of subjective document. The person creating the index chooses the categories that will be recorded in it. Because this was only a one-year project, I limited myself to index searches and looked at articles that were categorized under terms like child abuse, abuse in general, healing, misogyny, sex, silence, violence, wife abuse, and women's history. Because of this, it's possible that there are articles that I have missed that were not indexed under these categories, or if perhaps additional categories were, would have been more accurate in, in uh, cataloging some of these articles. The other limitation is a legal one. Some of the reporters on abuse allegations acknowledge that they received legal counsel for their articles. There are specific legal considerations for when you are allowed to name someone who has abuse allegations against them. Because I did not seek legal counsel for this presentation, I have decided not to name names of alleged perpetrators of abuse because I could open myself to libel suits, which I do not want. In future publication of my work, I intend to seek legal counsel because I do think it is important to name charged abusers to ensure the ongoing safety of community members and to promote collective accountability for sexual violence. I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge that some of what you will hear tonight might cause strong emotions, emotions of sadness, maybe anger, despair, hopelessness. All of these emotions are valid responses to the realities of sexual violence and the church has often failed responses to them. I invite you not to try and push away your discomfort, but to sit with it and try to inhabit the perspective of victim survivors and their advocates. Statistics show that there are likely both victim survivors and perpetrators in this audience. For the victim survivors, you might find some of this re-traumatizing. I encourage you to reach out to trusted family and friends or professionals for support. You can also feel free to email me with any concerns afterwards. I'm not a counselor, but I can recommend resources for support. I'm going to pull up a slideshow here that I will share. So I want to begin by outlining some of the most common attitudes that I found in newspapers towards women, sexual abuse, and victim survivors to give you a sense of the community climate at the time. The first common perspective that I found was a disbelief, denial, or minimization of abuse. Some church leaders and community members wondered if, quote, the problem is as serious as media reports lead them to believe, end quote. Others remarked that, quote, the tendency to trivialize the disclosures to wonder if the girls are sensationalizing an experience to gain attention, end quote. The disbelief of abuse had dire effects on victim survivors. 
who reported feeling alone, isolated, and betrayed. Lois Edmond taught conference participants the importance of believing disclosures. She explained that, quote, the seriousness of the victimization should not be assessed by the extent of abuse, but by the fear it has left behind, end quote. Similarly, another common experience of victim survivors was feeling betrayed by the church. For devout Mennonites, faith is not simply an add-on to otherwise secular life. Rather, church is the hub around which community life forms, especially in rural settings. Because church members are viewed as extended family in Christ, and many times literal family members, it is devastating betrayal when church leaders and other members do not believe or minimize abuse disclosures. One woman reported dedicating her entire life to the church. She had spent years volunteering, and when she disclosed her abuse, she says, quote, the men did not believe me. In their rational thinking, they thought I must have asked for it. They overrode the voices of the women who wanted to support me, end quote. She grieved the loss of this relationship. Pastors were neither comfortable nor equipped to deal with abuse disclosures. In a study that Mennonite pastor Isaac Block conducted with the support of MCC Canada, he, quote, found that only 15% of the pastors would tell a victim of physical violence to leave a spouse immediately while 83% would tell the victim to stay at home but seek professional counseling, end quote. Other women experienced a minimization of their abuse and were counseled by pastors to forgive and forget or go home and be a better wife. One coordinator for a committee on family violence testified to the high incidence of incest and wife abuse in Southern Manitoba and attitudes common to some that, quote, fathers have a right to break in their daughters, end quote. Attitudes of disbelief, denial, and minimization allow abuse to continue and discourage victim survivors from disclosing their, uh, their experiences of violence. Another common attitude um, towards abuse was a conflated view of victims and, and offenders. Some church leaders and community members expressed difficulty understanding the substantive differences between victims and offenders. One workshop's leader's assessment of abusive marriages was that, quote, we're dealing with two people who have a lot of the same problems, insecurity, low self-esteem, inability to be clear about what they want, and how to talk to each other about feelings. When you put them together in extreme situations, it is more likely that abuse will be part of the relationship, end quote. You can see an attempt here to understand the psychological profiles that harmful gender norms cause in a heterosexual marriage relationship, but this perspective still minimizes the accountability of the person who chose to violate another person and the depth of pain and trauma experienced by the victim survivor. Several men at a small group dialogue among church leaders expressed frustration with, with what they called overriding feminism in a presentation on taking sexual abuse seriously. One participant stated, quote, it isn't a matter of good guys versus bad guys. Victims are the same as offenders. Must we take sides? If so, shouldn't we be taking sides for justice instead of taking sides against the offender? End quote. The difference, of course, is substantive. As noted by a Mennonite lawyer, the Canadian society, in Canadian society, sexual abuse is overwhelmingly committed against women and girls, and it is no different in Mennonite communities. The final attitude I want to examine is retaliation towards reporting on violence. This was expressed most commonly in letters to the editors, which I have decided not to include in tonight's analysis just because there's too much data for 40 minutes. However, another place it came up was during uh, Wilma Dirksen's exceptional reporting on allegations of sexual abuse against a pastoral counselor at Eden Mental Health Services in the 90s. She was frequently asked, quote, why did you have to be so cruel? Why did you have to describe the details? Was it meant to titillate our imagination? Did you write the story to gain subscribers? End quote. <laughs> 
Dirksen acknowledges that reporting on abuse stories is difficult and that these stories are still held with great suspicion. But the women who approached her to tell, her st to tell their story, quote, felt there would be healing in getting their story out to the public record, end quote. She also notes that it is necessary to report the details so that allegations could be clearly understood and to allow the reader to know that the people making allegations were describing what they considered an intentional sexual overture by a professional counselor, counselor and not just an accidental brush that could have been misinterpreted, as some people were suggesting, she writes in the Mennonite Reporter. The way Dirksen reported challenged the very attitudes of disbelief, denial, minimization, and conflation of victims and offenders that were prevalent in Mennonite communities. Another way in which another way in which these harmful attitudes were challenged in the newspapers was through critique of theological and social norms by various scholars, church leaders, and victim survivors in both Dead Bota and the Mennonite Reporter. Because Mennonites are a religious community, it is important to examine the ways in which theology and social norms actually co-constitute each other and can either perpetuate violence or liberation in a community. As a theologian, I found it particularly interesting to track references to scripture and theological concepts in reports on sexual violence and abuse in general. In the coverage of sexual abuse in Dead Bote and the Mennonite Reporter in the 1980s and 90s, one of the problems that is frequently highlighted is that aspects of our Mennonite theology are at best causing church leaders and community members to ignore and neglect violence in our midst, and at worst are effectively justifying it. These theological critiques are made by people from all walks of life, including pastors, victim survivors, and scholars and in a variety of contexts, such as conferences, workshops, support groups, and research. I've organized the harmful theological views that appear most problem prominently in the newspapers into three categories. So the first is a theology of suffering and an ethic of discipleship based on a patriarchal theological anthropology, which I'll explain. Um, number two is the race to reconciliation, and third, uh, narrow definitions of peace and violence, sin and salvation, or forgiveness. So first, uh, generally speaking, theologies of suffering aim to address what God, scripture, tradition, etc. says about suffering and how we as humans are to respond to it. An ethic of discipleship within Mennonite theology usually refers to the attempts to emulate the life and teachings of Jesus within our social context as closely as possible. There is a specific theology of suffering that was, and to some degree I would argue, continues to be common among uh, Mennonites in Canada. In this theology of suffering, the suffering of Jesus on the cross and the scorn he endured throughout his life by political and religious leaders is viewed as something to be emulated. It is seen as something redemptive. By turning that into a basis for an ethic of discipleship, enduring suffering becomes a sign of faithfulness, the life and teachings of Jesus. The problem with this is, as abuse victims, social workers, and scholars point out in articles in Der Bote and the Mennonite Reporter, this provides a theological justification for the suffering of victim survivors of abuse. At a Mennonite conference in Canada, Carolyn Holdred Hagen, a psychotherapist from New, New, Mexico, New Mexico, clarified that, quote, there is a theology of suffering in the New Testament. Jesus on the cross is not a model for us to glorify pain and abuse, end quote. Theologian David Schrader wrote a lengthy article for the Mennonite Reporter in 1993, arguing that certain aspects of Mennonite theology reinforce abuse in our communities. He identified a distorted theology of suffering as one of these, writing that, quote, we abuse the theology of suffering. God did not send Jesus to suffer. God sent Jesus to do the will of God, to manifest the character of God, end quote. There was a strong critique of redemptive suffering as an ethic of discipleship across victims of abuse, church leaders, pastors, and scholars. 
Some survivors directly linked their experiences to this distorted theology of suffering that calls for absolute non-resistance. One Mennonite student of theology reflected on an experience of assault she and her friend had as youth in the church. They did not resist the assault because they believed that non-resistance was the proper Christian response to the violence. Reminiscent of passive interpretations of turning the other cheek, she said, quote, at the time, I believed I was acting like Jesus. I was suffering innocently and did not return violence for violence, end quote. In re retrospect, she has come to believe that, quote, silent suffering is not what Jesus advocates. Rather, the cross represents victory of and not submission to the powers, end quote. This critique of a theology of suffering that serves as a basis for an ethic of discipleship is a pattern that was reported on most commonly in the 90s and significantly more often in the Mennonite Reporter than in Der Bote. Finally, we can add the element of patriarchal theological anthropology to our analysis, a mouthful, I know. So theological anthropology studies the relationship between humans and specifically in relation to God. What I mean by patriarchal theology then is an understanding of human relations governed by men and human relations governed by God. Now, because God is viewed solely as a father in the Mennonite context that I analyzed, creation and the church are governed by God as man. This translates onto human relationships by putting the man above other humans. Theologian Mary Daly put this succinctly when she said, quote, if God is man, then man is God, end quote. When you have this kind of patriarchal theological anthropology underpinning your theology of suffering and an ethic of discipleship, you run into a lot of problems of unequal relations of power, which we can see throughout human history results in exploitation of those most vulnerable, in this case, women and children. In the case of sexual abuse, then, women and children are taught both theologically and culturally that to obey God means to obey their husbands, church leaders, who are primarily men, and other men in the community. The only faithful response available to women and children to abuse is submission to their abusers, almost always men. Suffering their abuse is viewed by their community as faithful, as following the life and teachings of Jesus. There was significant critique of this theological hierarchy, placing men above women in the Mennonite Reporter, and one comment in Der Bote. In a 1992 article in Der Bote, a Mennonite man seems to agree that women should submit themselves to their husbands, calling this as per Christ's teachings. But he also remarks that, quote, it is not understandable why men do not also consider Christ's teachings of peace, to live in mutual relation with their wives and to honor women, as per 1 Peter 3, verse 7, end quote. Um, that's my translation. All of the quotes from Dead Bota are my own translations. He says that instead of blaming scripture for leaving room for abuse, we should take a long, hard look and ask ourselves if we aren't simply misinterpreting scripture. Other writers in the Mennonite Reporter suggested that women's submission to their husbands was itself misinterpreted, not simply that men weren't fulfilling their role in the relationship. One man reflected on his participation at a conference on sexual abuse, confirming that, quote, as a man, I have been taught to dominate, control, and manipulate in order to be competitive, end quote. A woman at the same conference agreed saying, quote, women buy into this because of our theology of submission and service to the other without counting the cost, end quote. Isaac Block points readers back to Christ on the cross, observing that, quote, Jesus voluntarily placed himself in a situation involving suffering. Victims of domestic abuse do not, end quote. These critiques of a theology of suffering that is the basis for an ethic of discipleship along with a patriarchal theological anthropology, demonstrate a substantive change to dominate, dominant Mennonite theology in the 80s and 90s. This is not to say that all Mennonites were radically changing their theology and ethics to support victim survivors of abuse. On the contrary, many letters to the editors complain about the advocates for theological change. 
However, it is worth noting that this critique of theology is coming from both women and men across the community of pastors, victim survivors, and scholars. And it is an attempt to make the theology better rather than discard it altogether. This shows a strong commitment to the faith community and its ability to transform into a church that offers support and healing for victims of abuse, not simply in its responses to abuse allegations, but in its very theological understanding of who Christians are to be in the world. The second critique, uh, um, race to reconciliation. My phrase race to reconciliation is a riff on the phrase, uh, the race to innocence used in various critical social theories and decolonization. The race to innocence is usually used to describe a variety of ways in which white settlers attempt to deny their responsibility for complicity in colonial violence and other forms of structural violence. A common example is the desire for white settlers to claim indigenous ancestry and thereby absolve themselves of any violence associated with their identity as a white settler. This move to innocence is just one example of various ways in which white settlers attempt to avoid the discomfort of accountability for complicity in colonial violence. It is also evident specifically in the white settler communities in Canada when you look at the number of efforts for reconciliation and healing in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission versus the amount of work done on truth telling, which is very little. The truth part of the truth and reconciliation makes us uncomfortable. We would rather pursue the reconciliation part. We are prone to the race to reconciliation. The same is true for cases of sexual violence. Nearly 100% of the articles dealing with sexual violence in Dead Boat and the Mennonite Reporter in the 80s and 90s also mention the need for or hope for reconciliation, redemption, or healing. Even when the caveat is included that reconciliation and healing are difficult and perhaps even impossible, it is always emphasized as a goal when discussing sexual violence. In a 1991 report on allegations of abuse against a pastoral counselor at Eden Mental Health Center, the victim survivor filed a lawsuit after she felt her complaints were not heard, which was a common complaint of victim survivors in the newspapers. A representative of Eden Mental Health Center called this an adversarial move. He is quoted in the Mennonite Reporter as saying, quote, we don't see an adversarial stance as being helpful at all. Our preference is for healing and reconciliation, end quote. In a number of cases, leaders of Mennonite churches and organizations felt strongly that sexual violence in their communities was not an issue for the state to deal with, but something that should be addressed internally which often failed to happen. In other articles, authors recognized the difficulty of reconciliation and acknowledged that it was not appropriate in some cases. Mennonite reporters amplified communi community voices that were calling for church leaders to privilege the safety of women and children and uh, separation of the family over further violence and keeping the family together. In 1986, MCC Canada published a statement in support of women and children who were being abused, recognizing that, quote, sometimes for the sake of women and children who are being, sometimes for the sake of women and children, reconciliation is not advisable. MCC Canada struggles with this problem, realizing that although violence and possible death is a greater evil than separation, both are sin, end quote. Here you can see the Mennonite community begin to recognize that the marriage covenant is not necessarily the highest priority. Some advocates argued that in abuse cases, the marriage covenant is already broken and the separation of husband and wife is merely a public confirmation of that. The sin therefore lies primarily in the abuse. The abuser is the one who broke the marriage covenant first. Separation is then simply an ethical response in order to prevent further violence. A presentation by Marie Fortune stuck out as one of the only incidences, instances of addressing sexual abuse without calling for reconciliation, redemption, forgiveness, healing, etc. Indeed, her work is often referenced by Mennonite speakers at conferences and workshops and has recommended resource materials in the Mennonite Reporter. <clears throat> 
It appears she was a substantial influence on Mennonite advocacy for theological and social transformation around sexual violence in the 90s. Fortune's work drew on atypical scripture passages to think theologically about sexual violence in Christian communities. In a Sunday sermon, she acknowledges that, quote, we long for a vision of a new creation. She says, I want to honor that, but not prescribe or describe it. Instead of preaching about reconciliation of terror in the Bible, the Judges 19 story of rape and dismemberment of a Levite's concubine, bringing pronouncements from Jeremiah, is there no bomb in Gilead? And from Ezekiel, get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, turn and live. These punctuate Fortune's memorial to victims of abuse, end quote. Fortune acknowledges our desire for a new creation, for reconciliation and healing, but she is willing to face the full weight of the pain of sexual violence for victim survivors. There is no race to reconciliation here, just sitting with the truth, drawing on scripture to lament the pain and violence as a community. Finally, I turn to the narrow definitions of peace and violence and in turn sin and salvation that is critiqued by articles in the newspapers. The abstract for this presentation included a poignant statement by Rachel Neufeld, who worked at a women's shelter in Winnipeg as her voluntary service assignment for MCC. In 1991, she wrote for the Mennonite Reporter, quote, the work at Osborne House destroyed the myth I had believed that pacifists don't emotionally, physically, and sexually abuse anyone, end quote. Other authors echoed this realization that a narrow understanding of peace and violence had caused Mennonites to neglect certain forms of violence, like physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, and spiritual abuse. Mennonite theology names violence as a sin, but in the past, sexual violence was not recognized as a form of violence and therefore not recognized as a sin. A common thread in coverage of sexual abuse in both Der Bote and the Mennonite Reporter is the call to name sexual violence and other forms of abuse as violence and as sin. And similarly, to redefine peace not simply as the absence of certain forms of violence, but as active justice making. In a 1986 article in Der Bote considered whether or not mediation was appropriate for family violence. The author argued that, quote, for mediation to be effective, the mediator must make clear that violence is a grave sin, end quote. Based on my research, the movement to name sexual violence and other forms of abuse as sin was most prominent of the early 90s. This is in stark contrast with a social norm influenced by Mennonite communities influenced by theology in Mennonite communities to blame women for their own abuse, to call it conflict in the marriage, to decry separation of wife and husband as a grave sin because it was the breaking of a marriage covenant. The solution offered by the church was forgiveness. The victim survivor was counseled to forgive the abuser in order to maintain bonds of marriage as peace of the race to reconciliation. However, authors in both newspapers rightly pointed out that in cases of abuse, the marriage covenant was already broken by the abuser. There is a push to identify abuse as the primary sin and not separation. New Testament scholar Mary Schertz argued that, quote, marriages that abuse the sanctity of a person within them are not marriages within the biblical guidelines. She criticized the readiness of some pastors to sacrifice the sanctity of an individual for the good of the community, and that this needs to be re-examined. It is not a way of taking marriages less seriously, but more seriously, holding them to a highest kind of biblical standard." End quote. Others criticized pastors of cheap, preaching cheap grace and easy forgiveness. A, 1990, a 1989 article in the Mennonite Reporter captures a common experience among victim survivors as follows. Quote, when victims come, the church tells them to go back, forgive, love a little better, and surely the problem will go away. 
when an offender comes and confesses the evil he has done to members of his family, the church hears the remorse, the commitment to repentance. The church pronounces forgiveness and sends the offender on his way without any follow up. This must end, end quote. This pattern of addressing abuse in churches reflects a narrow definition of peace and violence and sin and salvation. It is cheap grace and I would add cheap reconciliation. There is no substantive repentance or ongoing accountability for perpetrators of sexual abuse, and there is no substantive and ongoing support for victim survivors. The theologically influenced social norms in Mennonite communities had narrow definitions of peace and violence, sin and salvation. The definitions of violence and sin did not include sexual violence, and the solution counseled for conflict and marriage, code for abuse, was forgiveness an attempt to restore the previous superficial peace. Many reports challenged the common notions of peace, violence, sin, and reconciliation. Theologian Gail Gerber Kuhns proposed a theoethical notion of redemptive resistance as a liberating approach to abuse. With reference to both the prophetic traditions and the life and teachings of Jesus, Gerber Kuhns argued that, quote, pacifism does not just equal surface harmony, but is rooted in just and loving relations and in solidarity with the poor and oppressed, end quote. In this case, the oppressed are the victim survivors who not only experience the pain and violation of abuse, but experience it again and again when they are neglected, ignored, and denied by their communities of faith. That brings us to a singular consideration that has kept Mennonites from seeing the harms of the dominant theological and social norms that I have discussed. And that is the failure to consider the experiences of victims survivors of sexual abuse. A few articles in the newspapers also call for a theology that begins with the experiences of victim survivors of abuse. As already discussed, the majority focused on various critiques of Mennonite theology that reinforced abuse. Isaac Block was one pastor and prominent community, community leader who called for a greater use of, of what he called experiential theology. He defined this as theology, quote, which starts with a human situation. He said, we must learn to do theology from the experience of broken people, end quote. The Mennonite reporter recorded the attitudes of participants at a conference in 1991 who, quote, called Mennonite peace theology to account for its past silence on the issues and showed ways women must be a part of correcting an errant peace theology, end quote. A strikingly similar report appears in Der Bote in 1992 at a different conference. Quote, several women are holding our peace theology responsible for silence on these problems in the past. They believe that women must ensure the better and betterment of erroneous peace theology, end quote. I would additionally argue that because women and girls are the primary victim survivors of sexual violence in Mennonite communities, any corrective experiential theology will also be an overtly feminist theology. In my research, I found one exceptional example of experiential theology of suffering. At a conference in Waterloo in 1988, the president of Women in Mission pointed out that abuse occurs in Mennonite families too. She told the story of the Good Samaritan and asked, quote, who are the broken and beaten who we encounter on the roadside? Will we be a priest, a Levite, or a Good Samaritan, end quote. This demonstrates one way of doing biblical theology from the experience of those who are suffering. A theology that begins with the experiences of, of those who are suffering is a Christ-centered theology. Likewise, in order to be considered Christian, Mennonite ethics must always begin from the experiences of those who are suffering. Finally, I want to close with an anonymous poem that was published in the Mennonite Reporter in 1991. It is entitled, The Gospel According to an Abused Child. It is Easter morning, 1992, a time for celebration. Celebration that the beautiful goddess child, the warm, loving five-year-old has come out of the grave. She is alive. I say it with the empowerment of a thousand voice choir. 
She is risen. She holds the secret of life beyond pain. She will teach me about her suffering. She will show me the scars on her hands, her head, her feet, her side. I can behold her beauty, the divine life energy that has sustained her body, a body that was broken for no reason at all by people who tried to destroy her spirit, to break her will for her own good, or so they insist. But her spirit is not broken. Though she has seen hell she has lived through it and she has been through that dormant state called death her memories and feelings are swallowed up that state of nothingness the divine goddess is not crushed her spirit has not been destroyed for she is alive and neither death nor patriarchal churches nor painful memories nor the wrath of her family will prevail against her for she is a part of god and her spirit is one with the divine spirit she is risen. She is alive. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie, for that uh, detailed and empathetic research on this very difficult topic. Uh, I think I can speak for the entire audience that we very much appreciated the insight uh, that you brought to this, this issue. For the remaining portion of this webinar, I'd like to open it up for questions. So anyone in the audience who has a question, please type it up in the Q&A section under the Q&A button. And uh, Melanie would be happy to respond to um, your comments and your, your questions that you might have uh, based on her presentation. And I'll just maybe start off with a question of my own. Um, what were you, during your presentation, you made some comments about the differences between the Mennonite reporter and Der Bota. Obviously this also represents generational differences within the Mennonite community. One is in English, one is in German. Uh, can you comment a little bit further about those differences and how they're approaching this issue of sexual violence? Um, it, I think one of the things I found most interesting is that in the reports on sexual violence, differences, any like historical or generational or theological differences between the various Mennonite groups were just not discussed beyond identifying the specific Mennonite group. And so um, based on like my research itself, there's, there's, not, there's not really any um, any evidence that addresses uh, any type of, of dif like substantive difference between these groups, which I found very interesting and odd. Yeah, that is interesting that that wouldn't have uh, occurred and come up. Uh, but we have a question about from Esther about, uh, so you pre presented on sort of 80s and 90s. Uh, are you interested in taking this project into the present? And can you if you have done a little bit of that research, can you make some comments on it? Yeah, um, I will be taking it into the present. That will probably happen in a written publication that I will work on after this. Um, I think one of the most interesting things I will do with the 80s and 90s in relation to the present, I mean, sort of, we have two sort of big influxes of interest in uh, sexual violence, and one of those was um, at the end of the 1980s and um, the beginning of the 1990s, and the other is with uh, the Me Too movement recently. There are a lot of reports in tonight that cover uh, the Me Too movement, and that's something I'm interested in looking at. You know, what are some of the differences between reporting on the Me Too movement more recently that compared with the reckoning that happened in the 90s? So yeah, that's definitely something I want to look at. Yeah, I think that that, um, you know, you, you, we can see the, the, the depth of even looking at these smaller moments in time. And as you say, there's been such a distinct change that has taken place um, that we can, there's all sorts of themes that can be unraveled uh, on this topic and on this depiction of, of violence among men in Mennonite communities. 
Other questions, please feel free to uh, put them into the, the box. Now, I wanted to, one thing that is very interesting about the way in which you approach this topic is that on the one hand, you have uh, done this deep sort of detailed research based on data, but you're also a theologian by training, right? And yeah. so how do you think that those two aspects of your research have worked well together? Like as a theologian, what do you think that you brought to this conversation that might be different than maybe a trained historian would, would approach these issues? Mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, there's this like false conflict, I think, between Mennonite historians and Mennonite theolo theologians and um, we should stop arguing about each other's premises and just try and work together more. That's my little pitch for collaboration there. But I think that um, my training as a theologian, it gives me a unique perspective because I, and also having been raised in the Mennonite church in, in Manitoba, I have this really embodied deep sense of how social norms, cultural norms, and theological commitments and norms act like co-constitute each other in everyday life. Um, and I think that's a really important piece of the analysis to realize that um, unlike uh, some other religious groups and other Christians, um, it really, the emphasis on uh, an embodied faith has a very particular articulation in Mennonite theology that is not seen in other um, Christian denominations. Uh, and I think that can be both lead to a positive thing, like you know humanitarian work and and, and peace and justice work, but um, it can also then reinforce um, violent habits if, if you know you haven't thought of certain uh, certain forms of violence haven't been recognized as violence and therefore have not been named as sin, for example, and things that maybe are named as sin shouldn't be thought of as sin. Um, for example, the debate around like, you know, is divorce or separation worse than uh, having abuse continue in a marriage? Uh, that was a big um, turning point. So we have another a question from Christine, who thanks you for your talk, and she wants to know about the use of the words um, the words of victim survivors, how they're treated in the reports, how much are they quoted, how much do we hear their voices, do you hear, notice a shift or transition in how much this is occurring across the years or across publications? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, first of all, I'll just briefly say, I should have said this in my presentation, but I take the word victim survivors from uh, womanist theologian, uh, Christian ethicist, Tracy West. Um, so that's where I get that phrase from. Um, how much are they quoted? How much do we hear their voices? Um, not as much as we would like to. Uh, the contexts in which their voices occur are in a lot of reporting done by Wilma Dirksen. Uh, she is specifically interviewing victim survivors who have come forward. Um, this is highlighted, especially in the case of abuse allegations at Eden Mental Health Center. Um, and in other cases where there are specific abuse allegations against somebody in a community, um, the, the voices of victim survivors uh, are quoted. Um, they are also occasionally quoted and identified as victim survivors uh, if they are speaking at conferences. Uh, a lot of workshops and conferences that were organized by Voices for Nonviolence, for example, across Canada um, would list they, that they had scholars, church leaders, as well as victim survivors sharing stories so that we know is something that did happen. Um, victim survivor stories were, I think, almost always included as a part of a workshop or a conference. Okay, thank you for that response. Yeah, because that's a fascinating issue about who gets to be heard within these conversations and who yeah. is elevated and whose is diminished. Well, and especially because, you know, in, in, in any kind of advocacy, sometimes you have, it, it's a difference of, you know, you're advocating for a specific group of people, but in the case of sexual violence, victim survivors often want to remain anonymous, so they're not re-victimized. Um, by the community, by community stigma, potentially, um, you know, physically harmed by someone knowing that they've come out with this abuse. And so you have this level of anonymity that can harm your self-advocacy in, in a way. Yeah, no, that's a very, very important point.
Uh, so we have a question by Werner who asks about uh, your, you analyze the views of those who wrote in these two major newspapers. They often would have been Mennonite leaders or people with some sort of interest or link scholarly interests or link to the community. And do you think what you found reflects the views of Mennonite rank and file, the majority of Mennonites? So how much is this just an isolated group discussing amongst themselves? Um, also a good question. There's no like really like 100% way for me to know how much it, it does or does not reflect. Um, I think one of the things I'll say about that is one, one thing that I found really positive was that it wasn't just reports by a small group of church leaders or only scholars or, you, you know, like it was a variety of people kind of commenting on similar things. And um, you could see patterns of certain reporters, uh, like Wilma Dirksen, for example, was a common reporter on the issue. Um, but there were also a variety of people who were involved um, and would report on various conferences and uh, report on conferences and workshops um, that involved lots of different churches in a given geographical location. Um, so I don't know what that means in terms of how much it was a, a conversation centered on, on a smaller group of people. I don't know exactly how far the reach is of, of something like De Bota and the Mennonite Reporter. Um, yeah, we can't really know uh, 100%, but I can say that there was a variety of interest uh, in pushing for advocacy and support and education and pastoral training. I mean, maybe one way to get at this a little bit would be sort of the letters to the editor. And I know that you don't want to, that's a big <laughs> topic, but are there any sort of maybe general comments you can make about what you can, what you found in those that might help us understand like the general public responding to some of these issues? It was a pretty 50-50 articles on um, complaining about reports of abuse, uh, sort of rehashing kind of the minimization of abuse, questioning uh, the fact that um, women were more abused than men, you know, kind of pulling the sort of not all men um, phrases that we also encountered in the Me Too movement recently. Um, but then also uh, a lot of people writing even more sort of a progressive or, or pushing the envelope even further saying you know the reports uh, are not even enough we need to critique this even further we need to be um the ways in which we address abuse um need to go even deeper than they're going uh so for some the, the articles that were published were too far and for others it was not enough i mean the other question is we don't know all of the things that were submitted all the letters that were submitted to the editors and what got published but based on what was submitted, um, the Mennonite Reporter and Dead Boat did publish kind of a 50-50 on -50, uh, kind of either side of the issue. Interesting. So here's a question from Erwin who said, asked, can you comment on the reporting in Mennonite media on abuse within pastoral contexts and abuse within other contexts, so home, workplace, etc." cetera? Um, there was more reporting on domestic abuse or family abuse um, than there was on sexual abuse specifically. One thing that was striking to me was that uh, in the index for, for the Derbota, there was no category for sexual violence or sexual abuse specifically. Um, so you had to find these things kind of uh, hidden under other uh, categories. Um, the topic of sexual abuse sort of starts getting picked up after a conversation of domestic and family violence uh, starts happening. So sexual violence um, gets addressed within a broader context of uh, domestic abuse and kind of uh, an, an, a growing awareness of uh, various forms of abuse and recognizing that abuse is violence and abuse is sin. So that was our final question, but you know, Melanie, you have this, this sort of uh, rich perspective on this very difficult topic. 
Uh, oh, sorry, there was another question. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna ask my question, then I'll get to Peter Rempel's question. But just as you're thinking about more people undertaking this type of research, what kind of questions or, or maybe source material or do you think that they should dive into? Um, I mean, I think ideally I want to highlight, I would want more voices of victim survivors highlighted, um, but it's very difficult to do uh, to ensure, you know, that an ethics committee will pass it to ensure that victims are safe in reporting and not re-traumatized. Um, there can be a lot of additional emotional uh, difficulty and psychological difficulty in um, being interviewed for, for a research study as a victim survivor. So um, definitely interested in still figuring out uh, a good way to do that and to find people who, who want to speak. Yeah, that's an excellent point of how difficult it is. I mean, it's their voices that are really essential to understanding this issue, but yet it's their voices that can, uh, some, getting at those voices can sometimes cause much, way too much harm. Um, and so there, it has to be done very delicately. But let's go to Peter as the, the final question. Uh, would it be helpful to the analysis to use the category of Mennonite pastoral theology and practice vis-a-vis -vis Mennonite doctrinal theology, both with their deficiencies? I feel like Mennonite doctrinal theology in itself is kind of an oxymoron because we are not like such a hierarchical uh, a church and we don't have like, you know, uh, like encyclicals and other types of like um, strong, like a published official theologies that we can look at as like our doctrine. Um, but I think I know what you're getting at. And, and I think it would be interesting to look at differences. Um, yeah, between sort of uh, sort of Mennonite official theologies and, you know, what's happening on the ground. I think it would be interesting. It would be helpful. Well, thank you so much, Melanie. I think that uh, I, I can speak for the entire audience and that we all appreciated your analysis. You're very, uh, it says here, Robert says, you're very measured research. And um, I think that we are just starting this conversation um, I mean, other people have done stuff in the past, but there's, this is, we haven't moved it as for, forward as much as we need to within um, Mennonite theology, within uh, the study of Mennonite history. And so hopefully this will inspire more research to be done on this topic. So thank you so much, Melanie. Absolutely. And thank you everyone for attending. And we will have some more events coming up. So please pay attention to the CTMS website. And we're so happy that you can join us for these evenings. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.